The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. This evening, the DuPont Cavalcade brings you the story of a bridge engineer who in his day won acclaim throughout the civilized world. James Buchanan Eads was one of the first American engineers to be consulted by Europeans. His writings on river currents and the control of waters were accepted everywhere as masterpieces of their kind. And his perseverance and inventiveness have been a model for men who have since built roadways of steel and concrete over American waters. These qualities are also attributes of the research chemists who work quietly and efficiently so that we may enjoy more comforts and conveniences in our daily lives. Or, as it is aptly expressed in the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. As an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play a special setting of the famous spiritual. Deep River. DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. James Buchanan Eads was born at Lawrenceburg, Indiana, May 23rd, 1820. Our story begins 17 years later on a pond near St. Louis. Sitting on a six-foot replica of a river steamboat is young Jim Eads, laboring over the last engineering detail. A young boy, Sammy Dobbs, son of a farmer, comes running up. Hiya, Jim, hi! Hello, Sammy. I thought you'd be here at the pond today. Gosh, you ran like anything to get here. (laughs) What'd you run for, young'un? I'm here every Saturday. Yeah, but maybe this is the last time. Oh, no, Jim, why? Oh, I waste too much time out here. You call it a waste of time to build a steamboat like this? 
I just about feel like this boat belongs to me, too. Well, you can have about a tenth interest in it, Sammy. Yeah? The James Buchanan Eads Steamship Company. Assets, one steamboat, the city of St. Louis, six feet long. Mm Mm-hmm. With real decks and cabins. Honest, Jim, she looks just like a real Mississippi steamboat. She's not a bad boat for a pint size. Well, it's all I got to work on anyway, so I may as well like it. Six feet of old boards afloat in the brook. All right. Jim, I know it kind of weights her down when you're sitting up on the after deck, but would you mind lots if I climbed out on the log and got onto the deck forward? Now, you wait a bit. I want to get the engine started first. You haven't got the engine, so she'll run. Oh, gee, Jim, I, I didn't understand she was exactly like a steamboat, engine and all. She's as near as I can get on poor materials and not much money. This is how she runs. Well, we're ready. How's that? Hooray! Look at her paddle wheel go around. Aw, oh, Jim, let me aboard, huh? Hey, stop, stop, Sammy. Miss Reed, are you listening to me? Uh, what is it, Mr. Dowd? What's the matter? Uh, when I said you could use this pond, I wasn't aiming to have my Sammy out here loafing with you. Well, I'm sorry, sir. I, I didn't know you had chores this afternoon. No, I, I didn't tell him, Pa. Uh, farmer boys always got chores. Not fooling around with machines, either. Sammy, if you want to live an example of what you don't want to be when you get older, it's this young man here who's still playing with toy boats at 17. I don't think you understand, Mr. Dobbs. I'm not playing. You're not, eh? What you call it, then? Well, it, this is school for me, Mr. Dobbs. Hmm? I'm practicing how to build machines and engines and the mechanical contrivances that go with them. I read every night, and on Saturday I come out and build. Hmm. Well, you're... Little boat faithful to the truth. Yeah, looks a mite like the General Clinton that I took once from St. Louis to New Orleans. It's broader than the Clinton, sir. I, I mean, it would be if it were full size. Mm. Watch while I start her up again, Mr. Dobbs. Listen to that, Pop. You want to show me off, Sam? This is the maiden voyage. Pop, can I ride on her? Well... Oh, gosh, Pop. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead and get on. Thanks, Pop. Here's a hand, Sammy. Yeah. Uh, take care now. Don't go leaping off that log too fast. I can get on easy like without swainer, Jim. All right. Let's go. Here we go. You blow the whistle, Sammy. Oh, sure. Hooray! <laughs> Buchanan Eads, made up for lack of money and little education with unusual talent and hard work. Daytimes, he was a clerk. At night, lost in books on engineering, he dreamed of future accomplishment. And when the Sundays were fair, he was master of a toy steamboat. At 18, he became a purser, and in every free moment could be seen leaning over the deck, studying the great streams, treacherous currents, and rapids. Four years of that, and he was ready for his opening adventure. It is 1842. On a barge in the river near a small town in Iowa, young James Eads is talking to Mr. Campbell, a business associate. Well, Mr. Campbell, have you finished that boat you were building for me yet? Finished? Heavens, man, you know it isn't finished. It wasn't supposed to be. I can't build a bell diving boat in a month. Say, you haven't taken a definite contract to start salvage work for somebody before you had any equipment. Now, don't be angry with me, Mr. Campbell. Nelson and Case and I got a rush offer for some people in St. Louis to come up here and raise a barge for them. Sang last week with a load of pig lead. And you just neglected to mention to them that you had no boat to salvage it with, huh? Well, I've got this barge. A barge, man. All pig lead out of the Mississippi. Here you are starting a new salvage company, and the first thing you do is to rush off before you prepare. This will ruin you. We've got the money to pay you for the bell diving boat, no matter how our business goes, Mr. Campbell. Maybe I did rush into this impetuously, but business isn't as easy as you as you think it is to get, you know? We had this off, and we had to take it right away. Well, I don't see anything but an awkward failure ahead of you. Well, we bought this barge, and we've brought a diver up from the Great Lakes who has his own equipment with him. That wasn't such a bad idea. It was a great idea, except that the current's too strong. This diving bell is no good. That about finishes the whole venture, I suppose. No, sir. 
I got a big hogshead. Knocked out one end and rigged up a slat in it. A hogshead? Heavens, man. That barrel? When you look it over, sir, you'll see. Ready, Mr. Reed. Ready any time you are. Uh, sure, Dick. Come on, Mr. Campbell. We're going to lower my hog's head over the side just to see how she works. Holy. You shouldn't try this, Mr. Reed. Oh, Mr. Campbell, uh, meet our diver, Joe. Hello, Joe. This is the rest of my outfit. I'll do. Howdy, Campbell. Howdy. 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 All right, now, just help me into this. Wait, wait a minute. Are you getting in there, Eads? Why doesn't your diver get in? In that thing? I should say not. Mm, he doesn't think it's safe, Mr. Campbell. Well, if he doesn't think it's safe for a professional diver... I've got to go down on this hogshead, Mr. Campbell. It's the only possible chance to lift that pig lead off the bottom and save the company I started. I think I'm safe or I wouldn't do it. It's not safe at all. Well, I know you don't think so, Joe. And I wouldn't ask any man I hired to do something I wouldn't do myself. All right. In I go, boys. All right, all right. All right. Right now. Well, seems like I'm pretty well settled in here. Eats, don't do it. Take the loss. All right. Swing away, boys. All right, it down. All right. All James Ede sits quietly. The barrel bubbles slowly below the surface into the treacherous currents. He can sense the heavy pressure of the rushing waters and knows that he should be near the bottom now. The air in the barrel has now become denser. He sees the deck of the wrecked vessel below him. On the next descent, he must reach it in order to get some of the freight. He gives the signal to be raised to the surface. Nothing happens. For a moment, he waits. He feels his heart beat faster. But in that second of worry, the barrel begins to rise. Steadily, he ascends through the water. Once again, the barrel stops. Suddenly, beneath the rim of the barrel, a hand appears. He grasps it, holds it steadily, ducks down into the water, and finds himself eagerly pulled to the surface. Oh, thank the Lord, Eats. I've never been glad to draw anything out of a hog. <laughs> All of you look kind of worried. Well, well, weren't, you, well worried. Worried. weren't you nervous yourself, Jim? Well, I... I would like to know why you pulled me up near the surface and, and let me sit for a while to think it over. Well, <laughs> Jerry got stuck right at the surface. We were running around here like we were crazy. Now, oh, listen, everybody. That first test is over. And it didn't hurt any of us. I haven't invented the best diving bell in the world, but it's perfectly safe. Well, I'm sorry I didn't stick on the job and get on myself, Mr. Oh, no, Joe. Yeah. You were right to stay up. Yeah. And from now on, any fancy inventions I think up will be used by me first, without question. Now, if we all get busy, we can certainly drag that freight of pig lead off the bottom of the Mississippi. James Eads have no diploma in hydraulic engineering. But off and on for 20 years, he lived close to the Mississippi, studying her rapids and currents, her hidden shoals, and her shifting riverbed. In 1865, Congress passed a bill authorizing a bridge across the Mississippi at St. Louis. But enemies of the project succeeded in amending the bill so that it called for a 500-foot center span and 50 feet of clearance because they thought that no one could build such a bridge. But James Eads had been appointed the engineer of one construction company and he insisted that the bridge could be built. A few months later, in the St. Louis office of the James Eads Company, Eads talks to the company's young lawyer and to a fellow engineer. You know, Mr. Eads, you can't blame people for not being able to imagine what you're promising them. Well, if they'd only leave the imagination to Mr. Eads and have a little faith in him, it'd be better. Oh, I agree, Mr. Slater, but besides believing it's impossible to put an arch across the Mississippi... They are mindful of the expense also. The reason I want to throw an arch over the river instead of building with trusses is because the arch will be cheaper. I planned it for cheapness. I think, too, that the rival company is winning some favor for its bid because their plans don't insist on, uh, well, on details like basing their foundations on bedrock. Let them base it anywhere else. The bridge they built at St. Louis... We'll be down to New Orleans. Yeah, you're dead right, Jim. You've convinced me on that. You think the the very river bottom, the sand on it, isn't safe? Mr. Dunlap, 
I ran a diving outfit for several years. I know the bed of the Mississippi as well as its surface. The usual river bottom is three feet of constantly shifting sand. In my experience, 100 feet of sand are sometimes swept away, clear to bedrock. Well, you can make it seem very real, Mr. Eads. Certainly, we don't need to give up hope yet. Unlike a lot of men with mechanical talent, you know how to argue for your beliefs. Yes. But the trouble with an engineer is he can talk just so long and uh, then he wants action. Well, word might come tonight, Jim. Or it might come next year. Uh, I'm going outside and look at the river a minute. Well, we'll fail you come back, Jim. You know, Dunlap? Uh, people. Take a long time to get convinced. Mr. Reed? Huh? Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry if I startled you. Well, you wouldn't know me in the dark. I reckon you wouldn't know me anyway after all these years, but I was your whole crew on the city of St. Louis. Well, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Little Sammy Dallas. Uh -huh. well, what have you been doing with yourself? Oh, working on construction crews in Chicago. I've done some case on work. I'm a good sand hog. I reckon you can guess why I'm back in St. Louis. I heard that you were planning to put a saddle on the old Mississippi. Oh, well, well, I did have it in mind, but the committee of experts uh, seemed to think differently. Well, Mr. Reeves, if the company you work for gets the job, can I work on it? You'll have more applicants than you can use, but I've been your man for a long time. <laughs> That's so, Sammy. You helped me over some difficult times with a toy steamboat. <laughs> if the bridge goes up, you can work on it. Well, thanks. Jim! Jim, huh? that fool young lawyer in there is having hysterics. I've got to break the news to you. Word from Washington, Slater? We get the contract. Mr. Reed, God, congratulations. We'll save the congratulations till later, Sam. Till how long, Jim? Well, about seven years, I think. Yes. I give myself seven years to get a bridge across that water. Let's congratulate ourselves then, boys. and his workers started to construct the bridge. In his long years on the river, Eads had become more and more aware of the laws which determined the water's flow and regulated its deposits. But only his inventive genius and industry could have overcome the obstacles he was to meet. Three years later, in a chamber far under the river, Eads watches a crew of his workers. Isn't this shift nearly due to go off, Sam? Well, yeah, Mr. Eads, but... I've got a feeling we're almost to the river bottom. Every scoop full of sand, I think we've made it. We've been having that feeling every hour for the last month. I think that's why we're all wearing ourselves out. Now, two men are down sick now, Sam. Well, last week we were so sure that we'd hit bottom that we all got careless about staying down here too long at a time. No, there's no excuse for that, Sam. I'll be the man blamed for any sickness or deaths. I planned everything to protect you people, and yet you take risks. Well, I reckon people know by now that there's danger in building a bridge, Mr. Reed. And if they got sense, no matter what happens, they won't blame anybody. Maybe they'll think about the poor devils that suffered for it when they're riding across what we've built for them. Yeah, let's hope so, Thompson. Well, send the men up now. Tell them to spend enough time in the air chamber. All right, sir. Hey, what's that? Over there. Hey, what's that? Are you sure? Hear it and see it. It's the rock, solid rock, like you claimed right. it'd be. Let me look at it. Yeah, right here. Now listen, all of you. This dense air is no place to celebrate. Keep calm now. Don't get excited. Yeah, don't get excited. That's a good thing to tell us. But try to keep from doing it yourself. Yeah. We're deeper down under water than anyone's worked before. Ain't that so, Mr. Reed? Yes, it's true enough, but the bridge isn't built yet. Hey, hey, what's happened? My candle's out again. Hey, there's no way to get the candles lit in this air pressure. Feel your way up the stairs, boys. Right. Now, take it easy. Stop. Call the roll. Stop. Sammy. The men say he's been down here on too long a stretch, Jim. Why hadn't one of you told me that? Well, he's the foreman. He wanted to stay. All right, get busy, all of you. Hunt around the floor for him. Sammy. 
Because you aren't. We're whipping. Easy. Sam Dobbs' grit and determination together with Eads' care, pulled him through. Eads kept the casualty list down to his careful insistence on safety measures and his own construction of underwater air chambers. As Eads met each apparently insuperable obstacle, he invented some appliance to help him overcome it. When he finished the bridge, the center span was 520 feet long. One pier was 136 feet below high water, 90 feet under sand and gravel resting on bedrock. In 1874, on the day of the dedication, thousands had come to view the modern marvel. Eads and his wife are watching the celebration. James, the speaker's going to give the dedication. James, what are you looking at? Huh? Oh, it's the bridge. My, as though you hadn't seen it a few times before. Well... Looks different to me today. All the crowds on it, band playing. You know, I wish I were down below a ways, so I could see the center arch against the sky. Hush, James. You ought to be seeming to pay attention. Oh, I'm not so interested in what people say about my bridge. I'll feel better when they start going across it. Wish I could see some of my men. Well, there must be all around us in the crowd. You know, they couldn't all be as into this bar. Oh, the governor is starting his speech. My friends, the jury of Illinois, some of you today have driven from hundreds of miles to see this miracle of modern science and engineering. This beautiful structure that joins two great Aren't you listening? Uh, I'm looking for Sammy. I, some of the men. I, my dear, I, I, I'm going to leave for a minute. I, I think I see Dobbs here. I, I'd like to talk with him. Well, I should think after all these years. All right. I'll uh, slip out of this box and I, I'll be back right in a minute. We hear today. It has been seven years. Since the three were some ambitious and practical men began to take shape in these lofty... <coughs> uh, what labor... Oh, Slater. What? Jim, for a bead's sake. Quiet, quiet. I thought I'd be more comfortable here than up in that box being stared at. <laughs> so you come here with your friends to see the great bridge open, Mr. Reed? Well, hello, Sammy. <laughs> Sunday suit and all, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Going back to Chicago soon? Well, afraid anything I do will be a letdown after helping to lasso the Mississippi. Well, you both stay with me, I hope. Doing what, Jim? Well, something will come up. I'm getting pretty lonesome today. This bridge it doesn't belong to us anymore. No. What I was thinking myself... Uh, listen now. So before I cut this ribbon and divide Missouri from Illinois, I again ask your thanks 
for the company, for the man who works for it, and for the chief engineer, Jim Buchanan. <laughs> That's for you, Jimmy. No, no, it's for you. And for you, Sammy. You remember the day when I said to save your congratulations till we could do it on a finish bridge? They've cut the ribbon. And the governor's carriage crosses first. Ah, neat pair of grays he's got. That sure gives you a funny feeling to see somebody on that bridge. Yeah, sure does. I think the Mississippi can toss her mane all she wants to now, but the bridge is safe. Yes, we did it, boys. And now we can shake hands. Buchanan Ede placed himself in the first rank of bridge engineers with the Eads Bridge of St. Louis. Foreign governments sought his advice, and many cities in the United States retained his services as one of the first great American experts on the flow of water and on river improvement. DuPont is proud to salute James Buchanan Ede, pioneer American engineer, as a leader in the cavalcade of America. <laughs> To people living at the time the Eads Bridge was built, the word plastic was only an adjective defined by the dictionary as capable of being molded into a desired form. But today the term plastic is used as a noun to describe a group of materials said to have 25,000 different uses and more than 300,000 different shapes. The first commercially useful plastic was the result of an attempt to duplicate ivory in order to make billiard balls. But now plastics are important and beautiful materials in their own right. The colorful handle of your toothbrush is usually plastic. This material is used in making the scuffless heels on women's shoes. You'll find plastics used extensively throughout the modern automobile, the knob on the gear shift, the easy-to-handle steering wheel, on the instrument panel, and numerous interior accessories. Then, too, laminated safety glass one of the outstanding contributions to safety in motor car driving of recent years is made possible by a sandwich of transparent plastic between two sheets of glass. DuPont chemists have greatly reduced the cost of making this particular plastic, thereby protecting millions of people against injury due to shattered glass. If you play bridge, you've probably seen the new cards that are cleanable and last indefinitely because they're made of plastic. Household articles made with plastics range from children's toys to beautiful toiletware sets, fountain pens and pencils with colorful barrels, transparent hat boxes, costume jewelry, and many others. Indeed, plastics have come out of the chemical laboratory to become a major industry, contributing much to better living. The DuPont Company alone normally employs more than 3,000 people in its plants at Lemonster, Massachusetts, and Arlington, New Jersey, where a whole family of DuPont plastics are made. Six million pounds of cotton linters annually, as well as two and one-half million pounds of camphor, most of which is made from the turpentine of southern pine trees by chemistry, are used as raw materials, thus providing a new source of income for that section of the country. The plastics industry is a good example of how research chemistry has created new products, new conveniences, new standards of beauty, and in so doing, has also created new jobs. Here again we see what DuPont chemists mean by their pledge to provide better things for better living through chemistry. Chemistry. <laughs> 